fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. Good morning and welcome to my Father's Place. Today's message is from Isaiah 62, so you can go there. And if I were to give it a title, it would be Restoration and Transformation. This is another, oh my goodness, kind of chapter where the Lord does things in us that we absolutely could not do because he's the one who restores us and by his spirit, we are transformed. So I'll pray and we will get into it. We are in Isaiah 62. This is the Bible study of Isaiah called Return to the Lord. Lord, thank you. You are the restorer. You are the transformer so that you receive glory when you do it in us, even such a one as me, Lord. So thank you that you do this, Lord Jesus. It is through you and it is by your death and resurrection and ascension and glorification and the pouring out of your spirit that all of these things are possible for us today. Thank you, Lord, for showing me the truth in here. Holy Spirit, may I speak it in your power. I pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read down through. It's 12 verses, and they're wonderful. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you forsaken, nor to your land will it any more be said desolate. But you will be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Verse 6, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughters of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Isn't that a wonderful promise? It is not just for Jerusalem. But he is speaking of Zion, that is Jerusalem, in this passage. But as with everything from Isaiah 60 forward, it is also spoken to today's believers because it pertains to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. That leads to restoration and transformation, beloved. So this is one of those chapters in Isaiah where it is hard to tell who is saying what, when. (laughs) All the commentators agree with me on that one. (laughs) Oh, dear. So the speaker changes here and there. Sometimes it's easy to tell and sometimes not so much. So the interpretation of the commentators varies greatly. But this is my understanding of who's saying what, when and a summary of each section. So in verses one through five, the Lord charges those who speak for him to continually ask him to restore and transform his people. 
so that their righteousness goes forth like a light and their salvation like a flame. Even if you believe Isaiah is speaking it, he's only speaking the words of the Lord. So I just say the Lord says. In verses 6 through 9, the Lord commands his watchmen to neither rest nor give him rest and swears that by his divine power, he will restore the repentant. And in verses 10 through 12, the Lord describes the restoration and transformation of his repentant ones. So, as I have said, Zion, that is Jerusalem's restoration, is the subject of Isaiah 62. But I also see the restoration and transformation of the ruins of sinning believers. I know, I was a sinning believer, and I was still in ruins. I have had bless God, a front row seat to watch the Lord restore and transform others. And it is just gives me great joy to see it. As I have taught you, Jerusalem was restored to the land after the 70-year Babylonian captivity, and the city walls and the temple were built. But as I have also taught, the people, his people, continued to sin after they returned from captivity almost immediately. Nehemiah tore his hair out, tore his robes, and their sin continued even to the days when Jesus walked the earth, as I have also said, because they rejected the very one who was sent by the one they called Father. So this passage is not simply about the restoration of natural Jerusalem, which did happen in the natural after the Babylonian captivity. I am called to speak to today's church, and therefore I will interpret this from a spiritual perspective related to believers today and what happens when he restores and transforms them. When you repent and re return to him, he will restore you. And when you're filled with him, you will be transformed. So in verse 1, Isaiah speaks, the Lord speaking through him. He says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth like brightness, like light. And her salvation like a torch that is burning, like a flame. For your sake, beloved, I will not hold my peace and I will not rest until the same is true of the church that Jesus Christ died and rose for. Glory to God. I will keep on speaking the truth that Jesus Christ will set you free from the slavery to sin that makes you a ruin even as you are an infant in Christ. We saw it all the way through 1st and 2nd Corinthians with Paul. He was seeking to restore them. He was seeking for them to be transformed because they were still sinning against the Lord. Jesus will set you free from slavery to sin. He says it. He will do it. That's from John 8, 31 through 36. I cannot stop speaking about what I've seen and heard, Acts 4, 10, because it is so glorious. It is so wonderful. It is so freeing. It is so divine because the divine one has done it. He will fill you with his righteousness. He will fill you with his light. And everyone will see it. If you will believe these words. Verses 2 and 3, I will read. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So this is the transformation of those who have been restored to him because they have repented and returned to him. And this echoes Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 3 
So I can say with assurance, because it is said of all commentators that that pertains to the coming Holy Spirit and the coming Christ, I can say with assurance that he describes the restoration and transformation of you, O believer, today. Glory. All tribes and tongues and nations and peoples will see your righteousness. That is the nation. All tribes and tongues and nations and peoples will see your righteousness. The righteousness of God who dwells within you when you're filled with his Holy Spirit and shines from you. All kings will see his glory in you. Again, it echoes Isaiah 60. And I'll read again for you. Isaiah 61 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. And remember, I said the apons here are within. Verse 3, nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness, the radiance of your rising, that is your shining. That's what this pertains to. And you will be called by a new name, which the Lord will give you. The third line of 62.2. You will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. Your name will indicate the restoration and transformation that he has done in you. My delight, in, my delight is in her and married. You'll see it in the next verse. Jesus Christ makes this promise for the end time to believers who overcome, that is, those whom he has made victorious over sin. Revelation 2.18, regarding the new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, the reference to partaking of him and his nature. And I will give him a white stone. And I look this up. This is an invitation that was normally given to people who were going to attend a feast so that they would be able to present it. So they would know they were invited guests. But this is an invitation to his marriage supper. I will give him a white stone, an invitation to his marriage supper. Oh, my goodness. And a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So the crown of beauty and the royal diadem refer to the position of repentant ones when they have been filled with his Holy Spirit. For they become a royal priesthood, a holy nation. 1 Peter 2.9 he holds them in the hollow of his hand, for he has made them pure and righteous and holy in his eyes. Such ones wear a spiritual priestly crown on their foreheads. A plate of gold, spiritually speaking, across the forehead. On it is inscribed this, holy unto the Lord, holy unto the Lord. In Exodus 28, 36, it was a foreshadowing of what he was going to do inwardly. For the priests of that time were to wear this plate outwardly. So now you are holy on the inside for the triune God indwells you fully. In his eyes, there is no crown of beauty more beautiful than holy unto the Lord. He holds it and he gives it. Verses four through five, the Lord says through Isaiah, it will no longer be said to you forsaken nor to to your land will it any longer be said desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God 
will rejoice over you. Now, as I have taught you, the Lord stands afar off from infants in Christ who are still sinning against him because their sin has caused a separation between them and him, as in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2. Now, others who see the awful results of their sin call them forsaken. They truly do. This is a forsaken one. I say that to myself and I say, oh my goodness, they're forsaken because of their sin. Lord, help me to show them the truth. Forsaken, that is, left destitute and desolate. That is an astonishing devastation, beloved. But he promises you today, little children, that when you see your spiritual condition, your poverty of spirit, and you return to him, and you ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit, you will be restored and transformed. How? He will crucify your sin nature that was the source of your rebellion against him, Galatians 5.24, and make you a partaker of his divine nature. So you will no longer have that nature in you. You will have his nature in you, 2 Peter 1.4. When that happens, you will never be forsaken or desolate again. That is transformation, beloved. Instead of being called forsaken, you will be called my delight is in her. And instead of being called desolate, you will be called married. Oh, my goodness. For a time, your husband forsook you because of your sin. Isaiah 54, 5 through 6. But now he will restore you as his bride. Surely, Jesus Christ's delight is in those who have repented and been filled with the Spirit as he commands in Acts 1, 4 through 5. He rejoices just as a bridegroom rejoices and delights in his bride. Who is Jesus Christ's bride? You and me. It's the church filled with his glory. So you must Obey his command to be filled. A church filled with his glory and therefore holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 27. That's who he's coming for. That's his bride. He has asked me to call you to ask him to do it in you. To prepare you for himself. I am jealous with you, for you. I am jealous for you. With a godly jealousy, beloved, just as Paul exhorted the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, for I am jealous for you. I covet you with a godly jealousy, a zeal, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin that is one ready for marriage. When a young man marries a virgin, that is a pure female of marrying age, they become physically one. There is much rejoicing at a natural marriage, at the ceremony, at the feast, and between the two. And the Lord will rejoice greatly when this work is done in you and you become his betrothed, his bride, set apart for the wedding day. Now, verse 5 has perplexed many commentators, for the Lord says your sons will marry you, and he certainly does not mean incest, for that is a sin. I was puzzled by it, so I went to John Oswald, the commentator for the New International Commentary of the Old Testament. He looks to other commentators as well when he's writing his commentary. So that's how I know many were puzzled. Now, this was really good because I wanted to be as accurate as possible. I always want to do that. I want to study to show myself approved. So Oswald explains that the meaning of the Hebrew root of the word marry is to dwell with or dwell in. So to natural Jerusalem, the Lord says your sons will dwell with you and they will dwell in the city of Jerusalem. And to spirit-filled believers, I see that the Lord promises 
that your spiritual offspring will dwell with you, that is your sons, and together you will dwell in the Lord, for he dwells in you and them, you and your offspring, your spiritual offspring. This is per John 14, 15 and forward. So in that way, because the Lord both indwells both you and them, and you are one with him, you are also one with each other in nature. So that's what I see in that. I pray that's clear to you. Verses 6 and 7. The Lord says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen all day and all night. They will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest. Isn't that something? Until he establishes, that is, prepares, and makes, that is, sets up Jerusalem, a praise, a glory in all the earth. So just as the Lord appointed Ezekiel as a watchman on the wall to watch what was going on spiritually and to warn, he blew a trumpet when he saw danger coming. Now the Lord appoints watchmen to remind him. What? Does he forget his promises? Not at all. But he really delights to hear our outpouring to him when we see and we say, Oh, Lord, oh, cleanse your bride. Make her pure, restore her and transform her so that she is a praise in all the earth. That gives him great pleasure. These are what are called intercessory prayers. We stand, we who see what's going on in the church, we stand between the infants in Christ and the Lord, and we cry out so that a connection is made and so that they are restored and transformed. So all day and all night, his servants will never keep quiet. They will take no rest. They will give him no rest from our crying because he delights in it. No rest for him either until he prepares his bride, the church. So she is a glory on the earth, filled with his glory, the church glorious from Ephesians 5. 27 again, the king's bride, all glorious within, for she is filled with his kabod, his glory. So that from Psalm 45, 13. Now, I want to make a note about the kind of prayer that we are to continually do and continually remind him of. This is intercessory prayer, and it is the only kind of prayer he commands his servants to continually pray. Now, there is the case of the widow who continually went to the justice and said, I want justice. Do right in my case that I bring to you. But when you pray for others, you don't need a long prayer list. For he heard you the first time you prayed, beloved. But he will bring those people and others to mind, to your spirit. And it is that moment that you should pray for that one. That is intercessory prayer also. That is to to stand in the gap between that one and the Lord and pray on their behalf and beseech him. So I tell you the truth, I will never keep silent until the church and the Jews are filled with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) They're his people too. They just don't see him yet. Their blinders are on, but he will remove them. If you look at Romans 11, my only desire is that they fulfill the Lord's desire that their glory is seen and their righteousness is seen throughout the earth. And he receives the praise and honor and glory that he so richly deserves. Verses 8 and 9, the Lord now swears that he will restore and transform by his divine power, by his hand. Sworn by his right hand and his strong arm, ate the first verse. I will never again, 
Well, is he going to do it if he swears by any part of himself? If he swears he will do it in his divine power, will he do it? Is there anything he cannot do? No. <laughs> I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner, those who gather it, will eat it and praise the Lord. And those who gather it will drink in the courts of my sanctuary. So just as the Lord allowed Judah's enemies to overrun the land, robbing and plundering and destroying everything in their path. The Lord allows Satan to rob and to plunder those who sin against him today, even his own people. I was one of them. Why? Why does he let Satan have at you? Well, if you're like me, it was so I would see my poverty of spirit and repent and ask him to restore and transform me. Satan has indeed come to steal your salvation, kill your body, and take you to a place where you will be continually destroyed in the endless destruction of hell. He's very happy to send you there. But Jesus Christ has come to fill you to the full with his abundant life. John 10.10. 10. So, though he allows Satan to work somewhat as his tool to bring you low so you look up, he also is the one who saves you and fills you, transforms you, restores you. Glory to God. Before Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ said Satan had demanded to sift Peter like wheat from Luke 22.31. Just so you know, this is not just Sue's thinking. And Paul judged a man who committed incest with his father's wife, instructing the church at Corinth to do this so the man would repent. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that is, the sin nature, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, he will save you from the plundering of your enemies. No longer will Satan be able to have at you and rob you when you return to him. And he surely will restore and transform you. Glory to God. He will crucify your sin nature with its lusts and desires. And Satan will continue to tempt for even Jesus Christ, who was sinless and perfect, never ever sinned. He was tempted, but you will not take Satan's bait. And you will indeed gather the wheat that is white for harvest, beloved. A harvest of souls. And that's from John 4.35. The grapes are ripe, ready to be pressed into wine. It is harvest time, beloved. Glory to God, are you ready to go out into the harvest? He will make you ready when he restores and transforms you. So repent, and he will do it. He says the harvesters will partake of a wedding supper with him. That is, partaking of that grain. They will enjoy the fruits of their labor, the grapes, and will praise him the gatherers will drink the wine of the harvest in the courts of his sanctuary. I love this. Jesus makes this promise from Matthew 26, 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit, that is the wine, the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So we will drink of that with him. Hallelujah. Verse 10, now the Lord speaks of the restoration process that precedes transformation. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard that is a banner over the people. So beloved, he's calling you to prepare. Clear the way so you're able to go through 
the gates of the city of God in heaven. This verse echoes Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The gates and the stone walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. The rubble of the ruins was cleared from the street, and the temple was restored in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, but the people still sinned against the Lord. So they were not restored, the city was, but they were not, and they were not transformed. But this restoration and transformation, the rebuilding, the removing of the stones, this is all a picture of the Holy Spirit, except that you have been built up when you are filled with him. You have been built up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13. Jesus Christ has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to build up all believers to the fullness of Christ until he returns. So when you are filled, you will walk on a highway free of stumbling blocks, sins, that cause infants in Christ to sin. What is this highway? It is none other than the highway of holiness, Isaiah 35, 8. As you go, you will continually lift up the banner of Jesus Christ for all to see. And say, he did it in me. He will do it in you. Glory to God. Verse 11. The Lord makes a proclamation. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation, your liberty, your deliverance comes. Behold, his reward, his payment for your contract with him is with him. And his recompense, his work is before him. So, beloved, he proclaims to you today, a deliverer has come. That is Jesus Christ. Your salvation, your liberty, your deliverance. He brings his payment for the contract you have made with him, for you have kept your part by believing into him. What is his payment? He comes even today to set you free from the power of sin, beloved and to dwell within you until he returns at the end of things. Then you'll dwell with him forever. That is the great reward for all believers. Freedom, liberty, no longer slaves to sin, beloved, here and now. The indwelling Father, Son, and Spirit until the end of things. That's restoration. That's transformation. So have you obeyed his command to be filled with his spirit? He stands before you now. He does. And he says, oh, pray. Ask. Seek. And he will surely do it. Ask your father in heaven to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, beloved. Restoration and transformation awaits. Verse 12 promises, and they will call them the holy, that is, sanctified people, the redeemed, the next of kin to the Lord. That's what redeemed means. It pertains to the next of kin, who is the only one who is able to redeem you. That is Christ. And you will be called sought out, literally, a place of worship. A city not forsaken, a city not destitute. When he does his great work in you, delivering you from the power of sin and coming to indwell you fully, you will be called holy, for he will sanctify you through and through. You will be called the next of kin of the Lord, for you will be an heir of God and fellow heir with Christ, Romans 8, 17. And you will walk as he walked. And be as he is in this world, so all will exclaim, this one is like Christ. You will no longer be forsaken, beloved, for your sin nature will be crucified. So your sin will no longer separate you from the Lord. You will no longer sin. 
I testify it is true, for he did it in me, in Jack, and I have ample evidence in this word that that is his intent for every single believer today from the time of Pentecost in Acts 2 upward, the fulfillment of the feast of Pentecost, the ingathering of you to him. It's a great word. It's a great truth. It's not pie in the sky. It's God in you. Lord Jesus, I pray your people would see that this is true, that this has been your intent from the beginning, that this has been your plan from before anything was. May they do the words you have shown me. May they see the truth you have shown me. I pray it in your name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth 